Hello and welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for bearing with us with the technical um, issue. So um, it is a great honor and um, pleasure to introduce you to this session on strengthening capacity to deliver the Paris rulebook through climate law and governance. And um, first I would like to introduce uh, our chairs for today, Professor Marie-Claire Cordonier-Seger and Dr. Fliordea Di Chomo. Um, Professor Marie-Claire Cordonier-Seger is a Leverhulm professor in the University of Cambridge and a full professor of law in Canada's University of Waterloo. She serves as Executive Secretary of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative, and she's a Senior Director of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. She's also a Director of Studies of, for Graduate and Senior Law Fellows at Lucy Cavendish College in the University of Cambridge. And she has also author or edited over 22 books and 120 articles and studies linking law, governance, climate change, and sustainable development law in nine languages, including courage, contribution, and compliance, the climate law and governance handbook, which is forthcoming with uh, Rutledge, so make note. And she also has served as a senior legal advisor to the UNF C COP presidency and to several other secretariats. And um, you yeah, and I would like also to introduce um, Floridea Di Chomas, said, and she's the co-director of Cambiamo, Changing Mobility, an NGO, non-profit cooperative organization, UNFCCC Observer, based in Madrid, Spain, oriented to action on sustainable mobility, equity, and resilience to climate change with a clear gender and inclusive approach. So, Marie Claire, over to you for, to introduce the session. Thank you and welcome to all of you for this special event on strengthening capacity to deliver the Paris rulebook through climate law and governance. I must say I'm very pleased and impressed and grateful that there is so much interest late on a Tuesday afternoon in the second week of a set of long meetings and uh, it shows perhaps the urgency of this issue. I'd like to especially recognize not just our panelists who are here with us and joining us online as well with backup videos in case there are technical issues, but also our colleagues, Vina and Marie Claire, who are here to help us kindly as leaders of a youth negotiations um, initiative, uh, which we are advising and partnering on. And also I see with us today our uh, special rapporteur on human rights and environment, Ian Fry, who is sitting quietly with a beautiful little bow tie and a very fetching human rights SDGs pin um, I, in, the, in the middle of the event. Um, we have many colleagues who are joining us who have expertise in these issues, and we need you all, plus about 100,000 more of you. So it is wonderful that we can have this conversation today. In order to open this session, I just wanted to make a couple of observations. In 2022, countries are facing critical global challenges which will define the next decades, perhaps centuries, of our civilizations on Earth. The risks are real and the science which interprets them is well recognized. For years, even as globalization gains speed, delivering equivocable benefits to millions, we have also been warned of emerging vulnerabilities. Scientists, doctors, and others in world health circles underlined serious risks of a global pandemic, now a reality with the emergence of the deadly COVID-19 outbreaks that are even today only a matter of recovery for some and still response for many. Students have joined scientists, leaders, and many others in climate action circles, including here in the UNFCCC regime, to highlight the risks and realities of a global climate crisis, extreme weather events increasing, glaciers melting, sea levels rising, corals bleaching, droughts and desertification spreading famine, and humanity's capacity to adopt and implement sustainable energies, carbon negative infrastructure, technology and lifestyle transformations, and nature-based solutions in time still far from certain. When countries celebrated the passage of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change under the UNFCCC in December 2015 in Paris, and its rapid entry into force nearly a year later in Marrakesh, a certain sense of constrained optimism permeated the plans of government authorities, international organizations, and business communities, even our academic and civil society circles. 
However, implementation of the Paris Agreement is not just an environmental or economic challenge. It's a development challenge, responding directly to the world's sustainable development goals. Concluding at the UN in September, just a few months before the Paris Agreement, the 17 SDGs and their 169 associated targets for implementation recognize in SDG 13 on climate change the UNFCCC as the key forum to coordinate global response to climate change. In the SDGs, ambitious targets also cross a wide range of legal and policy challenges implicated and impacted by climate change, including SDG 2 on zero hunger, or 7, securing access to affordable and clean energy, or 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions, just for example. The SDGs may be soft law, aspirational voluntary targets adopted to facilitate more coordinated international and domestic action, but a circle of international treaties and organizations, including the UNFCCC and its Paris Agreement and implementing entities such as the Green Climate Fund, but also many, many other international treaties, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the International Court of Justice, which is governed by the statute and will be tested soon, as it perhaps has never been tested before, as well as myriad national regulatory bodies across all spheres of human activity, are courageously struggling to meet each target, especially those echoed in the Paris Agreement's operational guidelines and in the many net zero and other pledges recently announced in Glasgow. A carefully crafted compromise to generate global participation the Paris Agreement is predominantly still pledge and review, backed by various mechanisms. The PAIC, Implementation Compliance Committee, the Sustainable Development Mechanism, agreed under Article 6 just recently in Glasgow for its operational guidelines, the Warsaw International Mechanism on NAS and Damage, and other instruments that are valiantly undertaking their mandates. However, implementation of the Paris Agreement across all parties countries remains a critical challenge, particularly since each facet of these requirements demand embedded domestic capacity, which is frighteningly limited in many jurisdictions. At present, it remains unclear whether the law is best described as part of the problem or part of the solution in this instance. While a grand majority of signatory countries have embarked with determination on the difficult tasks of designing and registering their NDCs and mobilizing domestic reforms, discovering both pitfalls and plateaus in the process, national experiences offer cause for cautious optimism, but also increasingly profound concern. In essence, civilization has reached a crossroads. With the global economy, nature, and humanity depending on what is highly limited capacity for compliance with our compli com climate commitments. One of the studies that we've updated just this year shows that 169 of 186 NDCs explicitly prioritizes legal and institutional reform in their plans to contribute to the global response to climate change. That's worrisome because we don't have the people in place to make that happen in our countries. Not yet, at least. And I say this as a law professor who participates in many international processes, but also is active in my own bar association and law societies and international law association and trains judiciaries as well as negotiators and legal advisors to delegations. Studies have identified 1,800 laws and policies promulgated to address climate change, and courts are not unwilling to resolve disputes, including tough ones. And we've seen decisions such as Urgenda, Rocky Hill Mine, Legari case in Pakistan, and many others at the national level that actually suggest that courts may be one of our main ways forward at the moment. It may be a priority, but the drafting, adoption, and enforcement of national policy, regulatory, and institutional frameworks to achieve higher ambition on climate change remains an ongoing challenge. <sighs> More importantly, we need to turn that ambition into obligation. And that is, in a way, what this panel is about today. It's the beginning of a conversation that builds on what's already been done and then asks us to scale it exponentially. 
Indeed, during COP26, to address the capacity chasm that had opened right in front of our feet in terms of law and governance leadership, professors, practitioners, judges, and other leaders from international organizations, judiciaries, institutes, leading law firms and universities came together pledging to increase climate law and governance capacity worldwide tenfold from around generously 600 climate law and governance specialists that we currently can count on to 6,000 legal specialists by 2024. We're engaging those qualified leaders in every legal system to convert ambition to obligation worldwide. And all of our institutions, all of you, can play a critical role in scaling up these contributions to build that capacity for climate action, to change not just the infrastructure, but the soft systems that we all depend on if we're part of our societies. So through this event, especially the partners being featured, and with this I'm going to pass to my co-chair for her opening remarks, all of the partners of the Climate Law and Governance Initiatives are trying to open the conversation on the law and governance agenda toward COP27 and inviting you to join us. We have a fulsome agenda today. Words of welcome from my co-chair, then briefings by expert colleagues, both in person and online, and then questions and answers in person and online, as well as closing remarks and an invitation from our Egyptian co-hosting partners and from the entire Climate Law and Governance Initiative. We're very glad you've joined us. I'm looking forward to a really interesting session. And I'm going to ask Floridea if she would like to also give her thoughts. Thank you very much for uh, uh, giving the word. Um, um, we are very happy to be, uh, glad to be here and uh, to co chair these uh, events um, that is very related to the governance and to uh, capacity building of uh, people and person who need to negotiate, who need to push uh, the uh, agenda of climate change uh, forward. And um, we, I will try just to, I will, will try to be very brief in the, this uh, introduction. Uh, I think that we have an amazing panel, panelist, uh, group of panelists, uh, including uh, people who are uh, uh, more oriented in research action, so they can uh, really show how can we can bring together the uh, theoretical framework with the um, with the practice practices and how we can uh, uh, adjust that. And then uh, we have as well the uh, more the national and uh, UN um, side. And we, we try to bring together these uh, different levels. And that is what uh, we, we need to do always. I like very much the reference to gender, to justice in the uh, opening by Marie Claire. And uh, it is uh, what we need to uh, try to take always in in mind when we are entering uh, in, uh, in negotiation, in a room of negotiation here. I see, I recognize a, a lot of uh, faces uh, with uh, uh, whom we uh, are uh, uh, working together. Um, and uh, it's true that this, uh, we, we need this capacity building. Uh, the first uh, uh, sentences of this event was uh, for uh, um, passing to from 600 to 6,000 uh, people uh, able to, um, to negotiate to have uh, this incidence at all levels. And uh, I, I would like to stress this aspect of all levels where we need to stay. Uh, we need to stay at the local level for empowering our uh, communities of uh, uh, women, girls, indigenous peoples, people with uh, uh, disabilities, um, and uh, with the, an intersectional uh, uh, approach as well. We need to stay at uh, uh, a municipal level, a regional level, local level, for uh, because they are uh, in, they need to to uh, to react to what uh, happen when some event climate change event uh, happened. So they need to be empowered to do that. And uh, and as well to involve people to uh, in uh, receive to be more resilient and to, to adapt to what happened. And then we need to stay at the state level because still the state level is uh, the place where uh, the, the law are done. 
uh, and European level is the, 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 or, or uh, in the inter um, parties levels is where the, the law are uh, promoted and we need to stay here where uh, 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 the, there is this kind of uh, mix between uh, negotiation, but as well the incidence on the parties. And uh, the, here we have all the world. And, uh, and yeah, I would like to re, uh, take uh, a sentence from uh, another speaker during another uh, uh, side events, saying the, the world is not global north, global south. It's the world. It's like a, a round world, and we need to stay together uh, for uh, facing the uh, the climate change. So this is uh, what um, I, I would like to uh, say from uh, my side. And now I think that I need to leave the floor to Marie Claire for presenting the first uh, speaker. And then we can have, uh, I hope that we can engage a, a debate together uh, with you because uh, you know much more uh, than we know and of different things than what we know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frodidea, and thank you again to Camiamo, as well as the International Foundation for African Children, who are co-sponsoring this event with us today. I'm very honored to introduce our first speaker, who is well known in these circles. Hafiz Khan is a legal fellow of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, and also an executive committee member of the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. Um, he's well known for his work with the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and also as director of the Climate Justice Center of Bangladesh. And he's also well known for his work, courageous work, drafting various national legislations, policies and plans and formulating the National Adaptation Plan in Bangladesh. Hafiz has been a climate change negotiator with the Bangladesh delegation for the last 13 years and is now acting as the co-coordinator for the loss and damage team of the LDC's group. He's also serving as a member of the WIM for loss and damage here at the UNFCCC. Because of those commitments, he has to slip away early, and so we've asked Hafiz if he would give a few remarks to at least provoke the conversation and raise some of the tough issues for us before he has to go. And then I'll introduce Ayman, and I'll pass it to Floridea to introduce two more of our expert speakers for today. Hafiz. Yeah, thank you, Professor Mariclara. Hello, friends and colleagues. So <clears throat> first of all, I would like to mention that the Article 14 and 13 of the Paris Agreement did not mention explicitly uh, loss and damage to consider the GST and transparency framework. That's why we had a very um, uh, tough fight in uh, Katawija to insert the relevant provisions into the GST and transparency framework, but we made it. Now there is a clear reference to loss and damage to be considered as a, as a source of input for the global stock take. Here, uh, if you follow the technical dialogue, also the round table loss and damage uh, is discussing with, um, with um, priority issues. Secondly, the um, reports and submission, those needs to be considered in GST. Uh, that is a bit uh, critical issues because uh, lack of national cap capacities. Particularly, let me share some of the examples for Bang Bangladesh. Uh, we had a bit difficulties with, with collection of data. Uh, management of data and also access to those data. Uh, we are working at the local level to, uh, as a bottom-up approach to promote the local governance for climate change. So um, that sort of bottom-up approach is really um, can help to manage those data. So uh, secondly, um, uh, in Bangladesh, for example, there is a, a SDG implementation framework, also NDC and NAP joint implementation roadmap. Those are very important um, plans. However, uh, while I was involved with formulation of the NAP in Bangladesh, I, I wrote a paper on legal issues. So I clearly suggested to adopt a um, Climate Change Act in Bangladesh. So in terms of uh, the plan of this NAP, uh, um, maybe Bangladesh government would take initiative to develop a specific uh, climate change law in Bangladesh. 
So with that said, I think uh, there, there's a huge gap in terms of uh, building capacities for uh, legal uh, practitioners, uh, also some of the uh, um, colleagues from the administrative. So we need to take some uh, capacity building initiatives at the national level, not only in Bangladesh, all the vulnerable countries, so that we can take some kind of bottom-up approach and we can comply with the Paris Agreement and uh, Paris Agreement rule book provisions. So with that said, uh, I would like to conclude here because I would like to move to the info inf, uh, uh, discussion. And if you have some questions, so I think P Professor Marie Clara response also, uh, Honorable Special Rapporteur uh, Dr. Ian Fry is here. He was one of the brains for us to support loss and damage negotiations. He might be able to respond to some of the questions. Uh, I would like to thank all of you. Ian in the back saying, I've got lots of work right now, thank you. But we will try to support our LDC colleague as well, won't we? Solidarity between small islands like Vanuatu and Bangladesh, both of whom are supporting and certainly facing um, some of the most frightening elements of loss and damage. And I argue should be allowed to be having serious discussions about restitution and restorative justice. We're joined online by a second speaker who is actually a very dear friend as well as quite a special person in the negotiations. He um, has uh, served for many years and many of you will remember him from the Marrakesh COP because he was literally ubiquitous in those negotiations. Um, Ayman Jerkawi is deputy chair for the IUCN's World Commission on Environmental Law and also a project coordinator at the Mohammed VI Foundation for the Protection of the Environment, as well as a senior advisor and lead counsel of the Climate Change Program of the Center for International Law on sustainable development. So um, previously, he's also been special advisor to the presidency of COP22 and uh, has worked for many different um, organizations across the board with important incidents in climate change. He's been honored as an African leader by the Obama Foundation and also as an emerging leader by the OCP Policy Center. He's joining us online and I'm hoping desperately that despite the sort of curse that follows me, the technology is going to work this time, and he'll be able to give a few remarks. Ayman? <laughs> yep. Luckily, we have a recording from him in case something happens. Can we play the recording? Yeah. Um, and I should point out that Ayman is one of the chairs of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative together with Hafiz and leading especially on the theme that looks at changes in national legislation and regulations. So we are going to go to our backup plan, which anyone who was with us in Glasgow at Climate Law and Governance Day 2021 knows we've got lots of them. <laughs> OK. And we're going to start it at the beginning? or. Oh, oh, okay. And loud enough? Yeah, okay. Yeah, what I'm going to do is give them a minute to sort out the tech, or for Iman to join us online, or for back at Plan 3. <laughs> and I'm going to pass to Floridea, who has um, the kindness to introduce two other experts who are fortunately here with us safely. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much, uh, Marie Claire. It's a really uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Pat uh, uh, Boland. Uh, it is a uh, uh, we work together, especially during the COPs, but then uh, it's a very um, important person in, uh, in for this, uh, for going, for promoting uh, gender in, uh, and equality in, in the COP. She, is, uh, she, has, um, she holds a master degree in political science and uh, with a focus on international climate policy. Uh, they are co-lead of uh, environmental education and climate policy of uh, life education, sustainability, equality, a women-led education advocacy, non-profit based in Germany. 
uh, in the pro uh, she is in the project uh, Equal Mobility, supported by the German Environmental Ministry, and their life uh, is collected by practices examples of gender responsive uh, mobility implemented in uh, Germany but is also a member of the facilitative uh, committee of the Women and Gender Constituency, uh, that I think that all of you knows, um, know, and has been uh, involved in collective feminist action in the UNFCCC regularly since 2016. Uh, I leave you the floor, Pat, because I think that uh, you can uh, uh, start. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Claire, and also Floridia for organizing the side event today and also um, inviting so many diverse voices to this panel who can contribute to capacity building for governance and law. Um, <clears throat> so um, thanks to the kind introduction of um, Floridea, I will just directly dive into my topic, maybe just to give some other landmarks, because I will really check um, the mobility, mobility transformation and have some very practical um, examples. Um, our organization is life um, education, sustainability, um, equality, and we do work in the space as um, uh, for feminist climate advocacy, but we also have a lot of educational project because we do think that the transformation has also only be done if we make sure that people um, in all ages, by the way, are, have developed their capacities, and they always already bring capacities, but um, develop their capacities to act against climate change. So, um, yeah, we have been heard that the future COP, the COP27, will be the COP of implementation, um, although at the same time we still face the fact that we don't have enough um, and high enough ambition in the NDCs, um, and they are not sufficient. And um, nevertheless, I would really have like to have a look into the implementation and the framework, the governance framework, and um, dive into the issue of trans transportation, um, which is one of the sectors that basically makes no progress in decreasing emissions. Um, and this is especially true for the transport sector in Germany, um, and this also um, differentiate, for example, to the energy sector. So we really see an uh, implementation gap there, and um, we have a project that aims at closing them. So also worldwide, it is true that the trend in the transport sector indicates rather an increase of greenhouse gas emissions, and this is not only um, due to, let's say, um, um, the freight transportation or economic transportation, but also true due to passenger road vehicles. And therefore, we really urgently need a legal framework that changes that trend, and we also need the political will to implement the policy frameworks guiding the way for a mobility transformation. And we luckily heard already from Marie-Claire a great um, introduction to the Sustainable Development Goals. And just to be really clear, we think that um, mobility transformation cannot mean that um, we are only talking about a pathways towards uh, low carbon mobility. But we must also ensure that this um, pathway is accessible, make mobi makes mobility accessible for all, because mobility is actually uh, um, is very important to ensure um, participation in the societies, and also it must be socially just. And only that, taking into account that, that is what it makes it truly sustainable. And both, so accessibility and social justice, are crucial for the transformation of the mobility sector and the transport sector. And um, together with implementation, of course, of the um, greenhouse gas emissions. So in order to do that, we argue that you have to apply a gender perspective. Um, and what you find if you are applying a gender perspective to make um, mobility socially just and also um, accessible, um, you have to look into what everyday mobility actually looks like for the people. So if you are looking at everyday routes for moving around, you see that there is a difference between those, for example, doing care work that often lies still on the shoulders of women 
um, because their trips is much less linear than those of those who are commuting, let's say, from home to work and back in the evening. And it's also true that the entire transportation system and the um, city urban planning sy system um, is all based actually on the assumption that you have this very linear trips instead of taking an, into account that daily trips can be really um, diverse and going, for example, for a short walk to, um, let's say, um, accommodate or um, go with children or elderly people to one place and then also do other trips, go to, to work eventually as well, and then go back um, and have leisure time, of course, also involved. Um, and those um, trips also, or this gendered mobility also can be seen by the choice of mode of transportation. So we see that there's also a lot of, uh, a lot more public transportation and walking involved for people doing care work, while um, the um, car ownership and the use of cars is much heavier for those who are doing those linear trips. Um, and also, even if a household owns a car, you can also see that the accessibility is often um, rather towards cis men, while um, the women in the households have much less access to the cars owned, just as examples. Um, of course, if you're also looking at the representation in decision-making, we see, for example, in the EU, that the transport sector employs only 33% of women overall. And if we are looking at urban planning, for example, in Germany, we see only 22% is the share of women in urban planning. So you also see that just because of that, a gender pers or a perspective of different needs is not uh, necessarily taken into account. Um, <clears throat> Nevertheless, it's also true that um, for this sector, for transportation, uh, the gender data is rather good compared to other sectors, such as, for example, energy. So um, we only have, or usually have rather, a data gap when it comes to new developments in transportation, such as digitalization or um, electric mobility and similar. So um, data, gender data can be absolutely also be improved, but just to say that it's not the lack of data, but really the will to implementation and the government's framework that is failing us here. Um, and then we also argue that number of studies have actually shown that if you are applying the different needs of people and take into account um, also the, um, the needs of the people when implementing um, climate action, it will make climate action much more effective. And um, this is also something that we can could prove to our, our project, which is called Equal Mobility. And we have collected different um, gender responsive mobility um, examples that show how um, actually a gender perspective can make mobility transformation much more effective. Um, so we would like to look into, I would like to go with you into examples that we have had in the, um, by doing actually a competition we were collecting and calling out for gender responsive mobility projects in um, Germany. It was actually inspired by the gender just climate solutions that we are having at each climate conference from all over the world. And we are, of course, focusing rather to empower women from the global south because we are also um, providing some uh, uh, yeah, award money for them and also want to scale them up. But we also know that industrial countries are greatly actually lacking behind of really applying a gender perspective and climate action, even though it's also necessarily necessary. So um, what we have is um, when we... And we were looking for um, applications, also contacting, for example, um, projects that we thought would be worth to be actually awarded. Um, we saw that we do have, for example, a gender mainstreaming as a legal obligation in the EU and also in Germany, of course. Um, and that was something that was also taken into account from cities. So we could see that gender mainstreaming as an instrument was where, of, um, for example, mentioned in the um, transport planning plans that go or applied over several years. But when contacting those cities and communicating about which gender responsive projects they would like actually to showcase with us, um, it, became, it turned out that they would not really have any implementation examples. They knew about the gender mainstreaming principle in their plan, but they could just not point out any examples. And this was either true because um, 
they themselves were not sure how to implement that um, instrument, or it was be pushed very hard by, for example, gender equality and gender mainstreaming officers that had an individual interest in that topic and took care of it. But then once they left, the topic was left out again. So we could see that the institu institutionalization of that topic was not there at all. So um, what we definitely need is not only the legal framework and governance framework, but also the institu institutionalization um, thereof that we are not only um, rely on individuals that are very um, ambitious and eft um, yeah, making that effective. Um, and then I also promised that I wanted to go into the examples to showcase by taking into account actually a gender lens and also involving um, people and planning and really make sure that public participation is implemented and climate action makes climate action more um, effective. And for that we actually had an example, so uh, luckily we also had a city that applied gender mainstreaming as a principle in their urban planning and they also had a good practice um, project. And what the project was about is actually quite, seems to be quite simple, but they had extended their tram line to like the outskirts of the city. And in this planning, they involved very diverse views and perspectives. So instead of just applying a consultation meeting, they made sure that they did different walks through the city or the suburb. And um, they were walking with children, they were walking with um, women at night, they were working with people with disabilities and they changed the planning according to their feedback. And what happened was that not only um, <clears throat> the planning was adjusted, but it was even put as a priority in the transport planning because it was so well developed that it could be implement, implemented earlier. So an argument that we get often is that gender mainstreaming is too complicated or gender assessment is too complicated, but it's not necessarily true, but it can really make the um, planning very well thought through and then also help the implementation. Um, and then why it is more effective is that the passenger um, numbers were um, truly increasing when the um, extension was put into practice. And um, yeah, this could be the passenger numbers in public transportation could be increased and could be really seen that the um, development they did were truly um, effective. So um, one really crucial point, and now I'm turning back to capacity building, um, besides the legal obligations that often already exist, is really the institutionalization um, through, for example, civil servant trainings, which they implemented also in that city. Uh, one person said that was also engaged in that project was that they were lying basically gender mainstreaming principles next to everybody, everybody fo everybody's phone to make them remember how uh, just, um, just climate action can look like. Um, and then you also have to make sure that, of course, the participation of gender experts, civil society, and also civil society organizations are um, really implemented in the full pol policy cycle, so in the planning and implementation, and then, of course, also evaluation. Um, and this is the link also to education and representation because you may have to make sure that the voices are more diverse in the transportation sector. Um, and then one development clearly that I've also mentioned at the beginning is to be not only looking at binary gender data, but really look at a more intersectionally, intersectional view when collecting data. So coming back to the UNFCCC, um, with which I would like to close my intervention is that um, also we have the Lima Work Program on gender and we do have the Gender Action Plan that makes really clear proposals on how to implement gender responsive climate action. We also see that there is a risk, and I think this is also true for ACE, what we will hear now more from Alex after my um, intervention is um, that it is by lined in the end in the negotiations. So we do not make sure that it is really mainstreamed through all um, the negotiation stream, but it is seen as a separate thing and sadly also sometimes not as important as others. Um, but it's really true that gender matters for amb ambition, it matters for mitigation, it matters for adaptation, and it matters for finance. And therefore we have to make sure that gap and the gap for A's are really mainstream through all areas. Many thanks. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, thanks uh, very much, Pat. A lot of uh, things to think about. <laughs> And um, uh, I just uh, you prepared the intervention of uh, Alexandra uh, Guznel Ishi. Uh, that uh, she work works as program coordinator on environment and uh, climate justice advocacy for uh, Soha Gadi International, a community-based Buddhist organ organization that promotes peace, culture, and education. Uh, including from a non-formal education, that is very important in uh, our um, arena. Um, uh, and she's actively involved in the advocacy work at the U UN uh, on environment and climate from a human rights and people's empowerment perspective. She has a PhD uh, in international law and uh, she follows uh, the uh, ACE uh, activities during this uh, uh, negotiations as well. So I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Floridea. Thank you very much to uh, Pat also for what you shared, for what was shared before to the organizers of the this event. Um, so I would like to maybe bring uh, two points uh, to this discussion. Um, so the first one uh, relates uh, to the informal uh, education uh, space. And uh, that will lead me to the second point, which is to talk more about what Pat was uh, mentioning as well, the Action for Climate Empowerment Agenda within the convention. So from the non-formal uh, educational space and its potential to really um, um, influence governance and um, action on laws, uh, what we I think I've seen so from various uh, experiences that we have in setting up exhibitions, uh, participatory exhibition. Uh, one in particular uh, is called Seeds of Hope and Action. So it really uh, relates to our relationship with the environment, with each other. And it really brings in a specific uh, stories um, of people and how they have uh, changed themselves, um, uh, their own uh, local community, environment, and the action they took. And what we've seen is that um, any system... Uh, even the best laws, if you want to find a way out, you somehow you, there are many ways that you can always try any system as better as, as it can. If people don't change, uh, at some point uh, we will deviate even or find ways around. And so what we are really looking at is like how um, we can ha uh, use tools and really come together with tools that will enable capacity building based on really strong hope uh, that lead to action. And so what we've seen is that stories are very, very effective. There are many studies that show the, the impact and the power of stories. Um, when there are concrete action in the stories that really leads to um, uh, concrete um, inspiration for people to really set up different things, uh, networks to connect with, um, and as soon as people connect with others, then it really amplifies action. Uh, so that um, really as a start, uh, and it's where we see, and I'm uh, bringing now uh, what's happening in the convention here, uh, so under the Action for Climate Empowerment, which we call ACE, um, it's um, so it's really relating to uh, it's both in the convention and in the Paris Agreement, and it relates to the six pillars of education, training, um, public participation, public awareness, public access to information, and international cooperation around it. And it's a topic that um, I guess has really, in the uh, last few years, has been, uh, fortunately I would say, uh, has had more attention uh, f across constituencies um, and where we are really trying to um, make progress towards COP27 uh, is to bring it back and to uh, um, elicit its rooting in human rights, where really the right to participation, the right to access information, the right to environmental education are really internationally recognized human rights. Uh, within the convention, it's really a challenge, and there are now negotiating, uh, parties are now negotiating 
um, an action plan. Uh, so in Glasgow, there was the a work program that was um, negotiated and adopted for the next 10 years. And now their um, parties are negotiating um, an action plan. And we see that uh, there is really... Um, um, I mean, there is really room for negotiating something that can really provide the right hooks for increased, enhanced um, action at national level and also at international level, really enhanced policy coherence. So they have uh, four priority areas in this action plan. The first one is policy coherence. The second one is coordinated action. The third one is really developing tools and support. And the last one is monitoring, uh, evaluation, and reporting. And one of the things that uh, we have uh, seen is that when they are um, um, when one thing that was mandated in the past was for countries to develop ACE strategies, so action for climate empowerment strategies at the national level. And when this is done, in a, it's not done in many countries, but when this is done and in, done in a participatory way that really enables to map all the various actors that are doing capacity building training, and that includes actors that we don't always think of, but even museums, for instance, um, and various um, different actors and bringing that together to really design these national uh, A strategies, um, it can really lead to very um, uh, good examples of uh, connecting various sectors of civil society and really um, in partnership finding the best ways when resources are scarce to, to, to really move together and enhance capacity building and training. Um, one very good example recently is the one of the Dominican Republic. Uh, and um, so maybe to conclude, um, I, I would add that there are um, various projects around m monitoring, reporting and evaluation, but there is one that is uh, being developed by uh, civil society in relation, um, in cooperation with the ACE team here, uh, that's called the ACE Observatory, that will aim at really um, provide benchmarks or assessment as to uh, how people-centered no. climate action, um, um, what is expected by the people in relation to people-centered climate action. Um, and um, yes, in this context, we really hope that um, and will strive for uh, really st strong hooks, including ACE national strategies uh, in the action plan, um, really maybe teams that would include youth really at national level, but also ways to create policy coherence where then we don't end up with ACE being just a small agenda item in the convention, but where maybe we have um, other constituted bodies of the convention uh, um, getting together with ACE and seeing where very concrete aspects of ACE, such as really right to participate, access information, um, uh, plays in. And so in these other constituted bodies, how do they um, implement ACE and how ACE relates to uh, their own work as well? Um, so, yes, I think I will conclude here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've both helped us very much with the key questions for this event, which, just as a reminder, were serious increases in capacity backed by awareness and engagement are needed to deliver the Paris Agreement rules and pledges, also advancing key SDG targets on education, infrastructure, gender, and justice. How do we scale up fast? How can climate law and governance, especially changes in institutions, public awareness, education, across Africa, across Europe, and all other regions, help us and contribute to setting the implementation agenda for COP27 and beyond? Now, we have a couple of participants that are waiting for us online. Um, I know that Ayman, who is in Morocco, we're still trying to make sure the technology works, and Michael, who is also 
hoping to be here in person and instead due to visas is actually waiting for us online, have a very good perspective, particularly from Africa. So I'm going to ask if perhaps Professor Christina Voigt, who is of course a professor in the University of Oslo, but also the chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law and has kindly sent a backup video that appears to be working, um, could maybe say a few words now to help us think not just about the ACE, not just about the WIM, but also about the PEAK, the Paris Agreement Implementation Compliance Committee. And then we'll go straight to Africa, have some questions and some engagement, and then think carefully about COP with our final concluding presentation. Let's see if Christina. Now, when it comes to COP27, or rather CMA3, in Glasgow, uh, a lot of things happened there. But um, outside the limelight, actually, quite a number of significant things happened also with to the further development of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. Now, as you all know, perhaps the um, Paris Agreement in Article 15 establishes a, a mechanism to promote implementation, to uh, facilitate implementation and to promote compliance. And this mechanism consists of a committee, and a committee is therefore established in the Paris Agreement itself. Its mandate is to um, facilitate implementation and promote compliance with regard to parties' individual performance, but it also has the We're getting pieces. mandate to address systemic issues, either based on request by the CMA or on its um, own initiative. Now, the... Um, CMA3 in, in Glasgow delivered on um, a number of things with regard to the uh, to Pike. First of all, the CMA adopted the first set or the first batch. The first batch of? Of the rules of procedure. For the um, for Pike, they are included in Decision Twenty Four CMA Three, and these are the rules of procedure that the committee had prepared throughout its first two years of operation. As you perhaps know, the first members were elected in Madrid in twenty nine. 2019. And then from 2020 to 2022, um, or 2021, we worked uh, line only and prepared the rules of procedure. And the first set was adopted by CMA3 in Glasgow. Now, the first set deals with uh, very uh, formal issues like the meet in place, the function of the co-chairs, um, the oath that the members have to uh, present, but it also includes some uh, rather innovative elements. For example, it contains rules for parental leave. It contains the gender link. It's rules for um, electronic decision making, and it also contains rules now, finally, for uh, observer participation, which is the default meetings of the committee, are open to observers unless
they're closed and they can be closed if issues um, that raise uh, confidentiality concerns are being addressed. But the, the, the default now is that the meetings are open. So it was a short video. <laughs> and we're hearing that the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee has adopted its rules, is starting its work, and has included a few changes that aren't quite the custom here yet, including the default rule that the Compliance Committee's meetings will be open unless everyone agrees they have to be closed. And that's going to be a space that I think all of us will be watching quite carefully. I'm going to say thank you to Christina for, despite the struggles with the video, um, giving us a quick update on their progress from Glasgow. Now, I think, especially given the video issues, we might be more careful not to try to play Ayman's video quite yet. He's um, currently in Morocco and trying to get online through the UN FCCC platform. And if he's able to, he'll speak to us personally directly, which might be a bit safer than... <laughs> um, especially since his video is longer than Christina's. Um, so what we'll do instead is we'll go straight to Michael, who is waiting online, and hopefully we'll be able to give us his remarks, uh, particularly about the need for climate law and governance, education and awareness across Africa as we think toward COP27. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Michael? Are you hearing me clearly over there? Yes, we are. Thank you. We're so glad yeah. that we can hear you. <laughs> okay, that is great. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, special event. And uh, my homage goes to those who are sitting on the high table there. I can see you from here. And unfortunately, for those on the low, low table, I can't see you, but also my greetings goes to you. And for we who are behind the camera, who unfortunately, due to one, or, one reason or the other, we could not be born, we are very happy to be part of this uh, special occasion. Oh, uh, I am very happy that I'm addressing this August body today, because uh, the issue of climate change is the same thing now that we have globally. We need to think about the future. And the future starts now. Whatever we can do, or we are doing now, it is what we portray us for our unborn generation. And that is why we have to be very careful whatever decision we are taking in order to build a viral future and a wonderful uh, foundation. Uh, we are also happy with the global solidarity on the issue of climate change. Unfortunately, we, we, we would have wanted to be more felt from the African uh, uh, continent, but uh, because Africa is in their need of sustainable development strategies and options. Uh, unfortunately, we are weighed down by political inter intolerance, civil unrest, and lack of political institution that is needed to drive, our, uh, to drive the climate agenda. But to some extent, we are also proud of the civil society who are also working in collaboration with various uh, UN agencies, who are also working with some partners and also some government uh, authorities to ensure that we also have a voice when it comes to the, uh, the climate issue. My talk is more of like an appeal because we, the slogan of the UN is that no one should be left behind when it comes to sustainable development. And uh, when we are saying nobody should be left behind, that means that everyone must be taken apart when it comes to whatever agreement or decision that is taken. We also felt the light when in Paris, the Paris Agreement was made. But the great question is, how far have we gone after Paris? We've been to Marrakech, we've been to uh, Madrid, we've been to Glasgow. And now we are going to uh, Egypt. I, we look forward to seeing what we call the implementation call. We have been speaking, we have been talking that this is a, the new world order we want. But we want to put all the necessary structure in place 
by working together with everybody that matters on this issue. That's why I was happy when Dr. Alexandra mentioned about the Glasgow Plan of Action that has been initiated in Glasgow. We want all these uh, development strategies to uh, want every uh, players, every negotiators in this area to work and see that these things are done. We want to see that we scale up strategies to develop the ends of the Paris Agreement through various uh, climate awareness and engagement, and especially in this part of Africa, that the level of education and awareness is very, very low. We are calling on every parties and international community to try as much as possible in order to carry that slogan ahead that nobody should be left behind. We want your solidarity in this aspect by seeing that we are also part and parcel of this synergy for a better world structure. We want to see a situation where the world is moving at the pace we want. It. We want. We want to look at what happened, with what is going on after the Ebola crisis. We saw what is currently going on about the, uh, the COVID issue. COVID does not know border. It does not know whether you are white or black. It does not know country. It keep on churning its own uh, 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 victims. That's enough should have sent a signal to us that we need to work in synergy in order to put an end to all this climate issue. Is it through mitigation, adaptation, whatever strategy that is needed? My own call is that we need strong synergy in order to do this. I want to thank the uh, Center for International Sustainable Development for coming up with this initiative. Yes, most of these agreements require laws. And we want to go back and see both our local and international treaties, how we can recalibrate our local policies and international policies to ensure that uh, the, the, the spirit of the agreements or the treaties we are making all along have been done. We will continue to armor on the need to build capacity. Civil societies in Africa need capacity delivery. And for them to have that capacity delivery, they require capacity building and training. We need your assistance in that direction. We want to work together to be able to achieve this purpose. So the thing there that I'm happy that we have representative of the UN there. We have the Kuchia and the Paris Agreement implementation. And we have a host of people here who are sitting down. We want to come out with a strategy. We want to come out with a blueprint that we will take over to Egypt. Because we do not want to say something and we'll go back and forget what where we are. We want to get something out when we get to Egypt and come out with something implementable which UNFCC can continue to fund for us. I don't want to talk much. All I want to say is that there are three key points here that are very important in my talk. We want strong synergy in order to drive out the Paris Agreement. We want international partnership in order to support everything that is needed in enhancing our capacity delivery. We also require global solidarity, especially from Africa so that all of us can move at the same pace. This is my little contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael, and thanks for having the courage and the patience and the goodwill to continue participating despite all of the challenges that you faced over the last few weeks um, as, as we were putting this together. It's, it's been very good to hear you and we will certainly take into account the recommendations that you've made and the three key points that you've raised. We'd like to turn it now toward those who are here with us. And in particular, we'd love to hear from you. We're right now in the process of elaborating the agenda for Climate Law and Governance Day, which is always held on the first Friday of the um, COP, and also putting together greater efforts to scale up capacity, especially in law and governance. And we'd love to hear from you what you think the most important issues are. Looking forward toward the implementation COP in Sharm el-Sheikh. And I'll just underline, as one of the points that Ayman was going to make, <laughs> if, if the video had worked, that because of the technology challenges and because of our desire to be inclusive, the Climate Law and Governance Day in Sharm el-Sheikh is going to be held entirely online. 
So in Glasgow, we had 1,600 registrants, and um, about 500, 600 of them could come in person. It changed throughout the course of the day, <laughs> depending on who was in the room. Um, in, in Charm, what we're going to try to do is to make sure that everybody who is registered can actually join us by, by making an entirely online event. Um, for Dubai, for COP28, we're back in person and we're already working on those logistical arrangements. But for Charm, we want to make it accessible, especially to our colleagues from Northern Africa who would not be able to come in through the security cordon if um, uh, we were holding it in Charm because of the arrangements. Um, I won't comment on the cost of hotel rooms, but I know that that security cordon would be a real problem for our law students, and yeah, they can join online, because we'll all be online. So um, please, if you will, I'm going to ask if Vina can help us as well, um, just to make sure that the microphone arrives, and if Antoinette can look online if there are questions from the online audience, and uh, we can at least take a couple of comments. We have a rich agenda here that has just been put in front of you, gender, mobility, justice, education, and we see a lot of gaps. Please help us to start to un unconnect some of these issues. We have one person right here in front. Thank you so much. Oh, I might, if it's okay, just take off my mask while I speak so it's not muffled. I think um, that seems to be the practice. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get that wrong. Um, so, hi, uh, my name is Emily Faint. I'm from the British Standards Institute, uh, which is the UK member body of the International Standards Organization. And forgive me, I think I've already accosted a couple of people before the event to talk a little bit about um, my interest in this event. Um, I found this talk really interesting and in looking at sort of your, your contributions respectively within this governance ecosystem. And I'm curious to know, genuinely, because I don't know the answer, um, what role, if any, um, do common or technical standards play in your, your vision of, of how we can fill these gaps uh, and deliver the Paris rulebook from a, a governance perspective? Oh, that's an awesome question. And it's one that some of our friends are working on right now, actually, as well. Um, I'm going to be encouraging you to put together a proposal for a session for CLGD. Can we take two more, and then we'll come back? I'd like to give a chance for more people who have patiently stayed with us with the video and everything else to give us some of their thoughts. Mm -hmm. I know we have a couple of colleagues, yeah. Hi, thanks very much for such a rich and really fascinating set of contributions. Um, I'm Laura from File Foundation. Uh, we work globally on climate law. Um, we're really focused on building the field of climate law practitioners, particularly people bringing cases and people who are kind of in that public interest sector. But in terms of regulation and delivering NDC and action plans, it feels like government lawyer capacity is really critical. So I'd be really interested in who you've talked to about that, what the potential solutions are for the massive capacity that's needed there um, globally. And then a question about ACE um, is whether legal empowerment of communities has come up as an issue um, and where. And I'd also be really interested to hear which countries you think have got the leading ACE action plans at the moment. Where's that best practice we can all look to? Thank you. Excellent. And those are two really good questions. Do we want to take one more? Any of our colleagues from the LRI or from some of the other groups? No? OK, we've got three questions. I'm just going to take a look whether we have a question from our online audience as well to put into the mix. Nope, we're okay for now. All right, excellent. Then I'm going to turn back to the panel. And in terms of standards, we have a little bit we can report on that because it's a really good one. But I wonder also if our colleague who has worked across Europe trying to make gender responsive governance systems for mobility, if Floridea or perhaps Patricia um, could say what standards would make a difference. Because in your talk, you referred to that. Um, actually, uh, it's quite easy to create a standard for uh, gender responsive mobility. Uh, we did a, a comparison, and uh, the, this is published as well, uh, about uh, uh, different countries everywhere in the world from uh, Asia, um, more uh, Asia, Europe, uh, United States, and the mobility of uh, women is, uh, is similar everywhere. 
40% of uh, our trips are related for caring. And this caring, uh, is, uh, we can say that 80% of this caring mobility is done by women. And this is like a constant. So it's, uh, uh, I think that the standardization of uh, policy, and then there is another aspect that is very similar, the use of public transport, the use of uh, walking, or um, that is uh, walking um, modes and so on. So there is a, a key, um, it's, it's easy to standardize the how, how many, um, which kind of uh, answer we need to give to have a, a gender responsive um, mode, mobility. And, um, and then if there is different degree of standardization, we can go through the collecting data, uh, and there, there we are doing this uh, effort in, uh, on the side of uh, collecting data for having a standard for, uh, to be able to compare uh, everywhere. But even if we keep the, the world like it is now, in the, we, it is easy to do that. I don't know if I answered to your question, but uh, yeah. I don't know if you would like Pat, to add some additional aspect. Um, I would have started actually differently that um, in gender, <clears throat> I agree to what you just said, the, um, the point, you, the way you answered, I would have first said that um, the um, challenges, of course, if you're looking into gender, is that you really have to take into account the local um, differentiations, and that you do see um, already also across Europe, for example, when you are comparing um, cities that have already in invested, of course, into, um, for example, biking infrastructure, or also really taking into account safety, um, um, individual safety, for individuals, also for um, walking path, etc. There is, of course, then a very different, um, very different basis where they are starting from. So um, maybe when when thinking about standardization, I I think when you are looking at benchmarks and looking like really what benchmarks um, we could set for other countries, then this would probably make, make sense in that regard. And to really say that this is the, the basis you have to apply for others, um, because you have already seen the positive um, and positive effects and also the contribution to more ambitious um, actions. So yeah, from that, that, that is what I wanted to contribute. And then I could just add, but I'll promise you a bilateral later with the person from Climate and Governance Initiative who really understands this work and is pushing it forward, Wendy Miles QC. Um, desperate need for standards in the sectoral initiatives and the pledges that were taken on in Glasgow. I mean, that's going to make it or break it. And the lawyers from the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance and the, and the, and the larger networks taking seriously what companies and others have committed, including GFANS, the whole finance initiative, and then saying, well, how do you benchmark that? How do you prove you're doing it? Especially with scope three emissions. So even in that sort of rarefied climate change world, there's a set of standards that are either going to make things transparent and clear, or else it's going to go again into that sort of murky area where we can't really be sure that that we've been able to hold people's feet to the fire sufficiently. And this is one of those gaps where if we have more legal expertise, we can hold people's feet to the fire. And we have to, given, given the challenges we're facing. So for gender, for mobility, and for justice, standards are key. And, and we're going to need you and your colleagues helping along the way, especially for, for those pledges that were taken on in Glasgow, that we only have a little bit of time to prove we're, we're actually meant, um, and that's always part of it. Now, our colleague Lara from File has, has highlighted two really interesting questions. We're going to come back on ACE. Um, in terms of practitioners and government lawyers, I agree with you, and I think um, my colleagues, uh, I know Hafiz had to slip out, um, would also strongly agree with you. Another member of our team, Tejas Rao, who's online right now and will probably have a question of his own, has been working very, very hard to connect the people who want to choose careers in this area, who want to make practice in this area, especially in the Global South, with those who are willing to support them. 
And part of the challenge that we've seen is that whether it's a government lawyer or whether it's a private practitioner, keeping each other accountable and keeping each other informed and inspiring each other and being part of a, of a whole field, a whole practice, isn't as easy and simple as people think. I mean, what I did when I first started looking at this as a generational problem was literally just to look to the other bars of my countries. And then I started talking to my other colleagues from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, from the Pacific Islands. You know, what's the climate law bar like in your country? That there isn't one, <laughs> was the first answer. And, and if you look at the criminal bar, or you look at even just the tax lawyers, <laughs> You know, there's like hundreds of them, thousands of them, and they're all working away on the different elements that they need. What we're seeing is kind of almost a, you know, we're trying to catch up so fast, and we don't have the time to just put courses into law schools and, you know, build it slowly the way others have. It might not even be a very good idea, because some of my colleagues are still working very hard on decolonizing the law. <laughs> <laughs> and some of these areas are vastly inappropriate for the countries in which they're being taught, which is a problem in itself. And so the other way of doing it is to reach out to those who want to participate, those who are looking for new career directions where they don't have to leave their values at the door when they accept a professional qualification, and then network them and give them a chance to meet. And that's kind of part of the inspiration of two of the four themes and streams of Climate Law and Governance Day. It's literally welcoming everyone and trying to bring them in and then giving them a chance to check in with each other. You know, oh, you're from Botswana, I'm from Zambia. We've been working on this. Would you have some solutions that would work? They're probably more likely to have solutions that would work than a colleague from Germany, much as we adore them all. Frankly, just to be fair. So, so that is also part of the challenge in front of us, and it's what we're going to be really looking at in our scale up of 600 to 6,000. I'm going to turn to my colleague on ACE, because I was really interested in what you were saying as well. Thank you very much. Yes, so in terms of legal empowerment of communities, um, of course, technically, it fall, uh, I mean, it can absolutely fall under ACE in terms of capacity training. The thing is that currently it's not, there is nothing close to it in the action plan. We did as a cross constituency uh, propose um, activities, concrete activities. So one of them was um, to maybe have a workshop on the barriers uh, to um, the implementation of the rights to access uh, information, participation, um, right to environmental education. So that would have brought that kind of like uh, legal um, or um, rights access type of workshop. Um, it's not Currently, at this stage, it's not likely to be there uh, as an activity at the international level as such. I'm sure there might be other hooks. We'll see how the, we, there should be another text tonight, so we'll see how it goes. There was another workshop that we proposed as an activity, which was also relating then more specifically to the uh, protection mechanisms and barriers um, uh, to the protection and access of justice uh, of uh, environmental human rights defenders. Um, well, then, of course, that's under ACE. When you go at the regional level, then now we have ESCASU agreement, we have the ORIS convention. So, of course, there are other tools. I'm just talking about what's possible in the framework we have here. Um, at the national level, uh, uh, I'm sure it could be included in national ACE strategies, and then that would be up to the national level. We also try to include, um, and we think it would be great to have, a capacity training of the ACE national focal points uh, in relation to these rights too. Now, um, whether it's going to take place, whether it's going to be possible, um, it's still like um, there is definitely a will to have um, something for ACE national focal points. But then the content of it, we don't know. In terms of national ACE strategies, uh, currently, I think there is so a uh, Dominican Republic uh, is a very interesting in their process, and they also, um, um, it was really participatory. They have um, now a, a web portal that has a lot in relation to access to information in terms of what the Dominican Republic does in terms of climate action. Um, underway, there is Argentina, Colombia, and Costa Rica. 
currently. Uh, there is Ghana, uh, uh, or Ghana already has one as well. Um, now, um, there are still, as you can see, basically a lot to be done in terms of all the other countries who don't have an ACE national strategy. And there is a lot of potential uh, in there as well. Um, and yes, so basically what we've seen so far is that it's been more uh, coming back to ACE in the convention, it's been more of sharing good practices. But we would like to maybe use it more to go to like some training and capacity building to uh, within the realm of where it is. Huh? Capacity building and training happens in many other arenas. But one last hook would be the Paris Committee on capacity building and they have set that capacity hub and we've just learned today from the PCCB discussions that um, one theme, one extra theme, one full day at COP27, sh it should be agreed that uh, would be uh, focused on ACE. So that's one yet other hook that could be interesting. We'll definitely look to follow that up. Thank you. I wanted to open up if there were any last questions from the group. Excellent. And Michael, did you have any last thoughts you wanted to leave us with, if you're still online? We'll work with the technology. OK, then I'm going to turn to Antoinette to help us to close sure. with an invitation, because that's the best kind of closing. Think, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for staying uh, awake. <laughs> it has been a very, very um, interesting and exciting um, session. Uh, issues of gender, mobility, justice, and uh, as um, Marie Claire said, um, you know, invitation and inspiration. So, uh, skip through a few of these slides. So, basically, I wanted to know, I wanted to tell you about what the Climate Law and Governance Initiative is. And um, very briefly, it's a co collaborative partnership to advance climate law and governance through implementation of the UNFCCC and its Paris Agreement. And I know that Marie Claire has mentioned a, um, a few points already about um, the initiative, but I, I also wanted to highlight that um, it's supported by the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, the International Law Association, and many other international bodies in relation to law. And we also have uh, a network of 200 plus partners, including law firms, um, universities, uh, government legal advisors, um, advisors, and others, as, as you can see on the screen. And um, also uh, focuses on the legal and institutional responses um, to climate change, complementing and enhancing ongoing efforts for sustainable development, goal 13, which is climate action. And also, um, as you can see from this panel, is to facilitate the co-generation um, co of climate law and governance knowledge and building capacity through law and policy innovation, research, um, and others. And also, wait, so let me see if it's there. Here we go. And oops, apologies. Go to the next one. <laughs> and also, um, develop um, professionals and effectively tra train them in climate law and governance. And uh, also has been mentioned, and I'm sure um, from your own experiences, we do need more people to actually um, be properly trained in climate law um, and governance. So um, just about the origin, origins a little bit. Um, it started at COP11 in Montreal in 2005. And um, it began as a partnership with what's supposed to be 40 people and um, there was an invitation sent and 400 people turned up, which uh, <laughs> it, very, very busy. And since then it has been developing um, every year through, um, through all the different um, COPs. So uh, we still continue to organize Climate Law and Governance Day and um, a specialization course. So keep, keep your eyes open and, uh, for the course coming up um, in, uh, during COP as well, round tables and different projects. And uh, I know Marie Claire already mentioned the, the pledge, but it's good to highlight that uh, we want to go from 600 to 6,000 by 2024. So um, if, um, you know, hopefully we'll be, be able to build that much faster than, um, than we envisage. And in the last COP in Glasgow, we had over um, 1,000 registrants from over 100, 120 countries and um, that joined online and in person. 
So it has developed into a very elaborative day uh, with 16 um, substantive uh, sessions and three high plenaries. And of course, it culminated in um, our 2021 Climate Law and Governance Global Leadership Award. And we also have a student essay that um, in three different languages. And now, um, because of Egypt, we also have, um, hoping to have it in, um, in Arabic. So that's wonderful. And um, yeah, I know you did mention the four um, themes, um, Marie Claire, but they're there again for you to, um, to remind you what, um, what they are. And um, yeah, and in relation to the governance of, um, of CLGI, we have an international program com committee, and it's shared by past, present, and future co-hosts. And we also have um, executive secretary, uh, graduate students, and as I said, 200 plus partners. And there are a few pictures there as well that we added from um, this, the strip one. That one is from, um, from COP26. Um, and our co invitation for the global governance day and then the training. Um, so yes, um, as I said, it's, it's an invitation, opportunities to collaborate towards COP27. Um, uh, there will be um, a call out as well for different submissions. There is our website as well, it's uh, climatelawgovernance.org, and also if you're on Twitter, please follow us. Um, I'm a Twitter fan, so there is, a, <laughs> there is the hashtag, um, sorry, not the hashtag, the handle is CLG Initiative, so uh, please feel free, and um, we always put updates there as well. So um, with that in mind, I wanted to thank you for um, staying with us, for people on online as well, and if you want to go back as well to watch this session, it will be available on YouTube. So thank you, merci, gracias, obrigada, danke, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in, um, I was gonna say, online in, in the future. Thank you.